Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Jack Films here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the next installment of the Jurassic Park Legacy Reviews. But I'm afraid we don't have too much time, so I'm just gonna cut right to the chase. This production began shortly after the release of Jurassic World Dominion in the writing process and took a couple of years to put off the ground due to our 10th anniversary special and a few other projects we had to do on the side. And this is probably our most elaborate production with Jurassic Park and there's so many people to thank of the credits and you'll see them as they go past, but I couldn't have done it without all their support from the cast and crew and especially our supporters on Patreon. If you guys want to go donate to the channel, just a dollar or more will get you early access to all of our content as well as other special features. So we hope you enjoy this four-part endeavor be sure to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with your friends, and enjoy the show. And, oh, I believe it's lunchtime. Hopefully for us. Welcome back to Jurassic Park. Enjoy. The following is a fan-based video review under fair use. The Jurassic Park and Jurassic World IP are owned by Universal Pictures, Amblin Entertainment, Legendary Pictures, Netflix, Steven Spielberg, Frank Marshall, Kathleen Kennedy, and the Michael Crichton Estate. Please support the official release and streaming services. <laughs> You sure you're okay, kid? You went from the East Coast to your next trip rather quick. You didn't pack much. Yeah, I'll be okay. I'll take the stuff we obtained from the lab and I'll have it stored when I get back. I'm surprised they found you so quickly. Such a short period of time after all that's gone down. Yeah, better to get it done and over with. Besides, I was invited as a favor for what I had to borrow from them. Ah, attention passengers, this is your captain speaking. We are now approaching East Lud Ventura and will be landing shortly. Please pack all personal effects and passenger seatbelts for the landing. Thank you for flying with us today. I gotta go, love. We're about to land. Where exactly did they take you? Yeah.
up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome to the next wave of Jurassic Park Legacy Reviews, and as you can see, there's a lot to celebrate this time around. Despite me missing out on the latest Jurassic film in 2022, and on the original film's 30th anniversary, this year I'm making up for lost time and right on the nose of a new film in the works. It's hard to believe that Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park came out over 30 years ago back in 1993, or as I've called it, the year of the dinosaur. Humans and dinosaurs and the apparently insatiable curiosity that we have about them. This fascination with dinosaurs is bound to get a boost next month with the release of a much-touted motion picture. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Ferocious or fluffy, there's no doubt dinosaurs have roared back from extinction. From full-size models to toys you can buy in the store, dinosaurs are definitely taking off. Go, go, Power Rangers! The mighty Morphin Power Rangers have kept kids mesmerized in front of their TV sets ever since it debuted two years ago. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Very funny, Adam. And for the occasion, you're getting four new adventures here at the park, from its origins, spin-off, short subjects, and my thoughts on the latest film in the franchise. And thankfully this time around, I've been invited by InGen's latest buyout to take a look at their newest island and have a very special guide on hand. Ah, uh, Dr. Buckin, pleased to have you here. Well, hey, hey, what do you know? It's John Hammond in the flesh. In case you're wondering about the advancements of theme park and genetic technology, the abilities of human cloning have allowed the return of the man who created Jurassic Park himself, Mr. John Hammond, with the same conscience intact to help better tune this variant of Jurassic Park. That's right, Dr. Buckingham. Oh, please, call me John. Only if you call me Roger. Done and done. So, Roger, why don't you show us around your latest endeavor? Of course, of course. Come along with right. 30 years ago, the original Joan Herman, myself had a dream to bring the wonders of our past into the future, beyond. While he never lived to see it until now and after a few decades of tweaks to fix, we feel this time that we hear at Jurassic Park with this. The most advanced park to date is a thousand person floors. We have ensured that all of our visitors are well kept and safe and that all of our employees are equally paid, compensated and will ensure that sabotage is inconceivable. Our sets are in more open spaces. Breeding control is well kept, keeping the population balanced. And the predators are fed on every hour of every day to ensure better safety between us, the animals themselves. Very impressive, Roger. So does this mean we're gonna finally take more from the playbook and give the tourists a brand new experience this time around? The playbook. Ah, my dear boy. Those books are outdated. Um, okay. Does this mean we're gonna see new exciting species taken from both scientific accuracy and from the playbook? Actually, we have something even better. Really? <laughs> okay, hit it on me. We're going with the familiarity of the first Jurassic Park. Yes, we'll be implementing the same experiences as the previous adventures 30 years ago. So, you have a newly advanced Jurassic Park with the highest technology and security, and the best thing you can think of to give your audience and tourists a new experience is to just rehash the old stuff and the nostalgia for the first one? Yes. We spared no expense this time. That sounds nothing like the playbook. The script. No! The original best-selling books by Michael Crichton! Yeah, this was a given that this time around we're going backwards from visuals of movies to the literature of books. Since the King Kong Books episode did so well, I figured we'd get into the authorizations of Jurassic Park. Now, this won't be a review of the sheer amount of books from comic books and making ofs, which there are plenty of after the film's release and the franchise. I'm talking more about the two Jurassic Bibles of the franchise with the original duology novels by acclaimed novelist Michael Crichton. Before writing the books, Michael Crichton was a well-known novelist on par with the popularity of Stephen King. His most successful books included The Adronima Strain, The Great Train Robbery, his take on the gorilla monster genre with Congo, and of course his most popular book predating Jurassic Park with Westworld. All of which have been adapted to film with actors like the delicious Tim Curry as the star attraction. No, no, the diamonds are here! 
The origins in creating the book stem back from Crichton's fascination from an article he read on a university student's theory of resurrecting a pterosaur via genetic science, which since then became his biggest obsessions when pitching the story to friends and colleagues throughout the 80s. The notion that extinct animals can be recreated genetically is something that's been discussed for at least 10 years in scientific literature, and when I first started, I was talking to friends at MIT and saying, you know, I have this idea about engineering dinosaurs, and some of them said, yeah, you know, it'll probably work, and <laughs> which, was, which was kind of encouraging to me. Even before the novel was published, he also made mention of his writing to one Steven Spielberg in the late 80s. Michael Crichton and I were actually working on another project together, a screenplay, and I asked him, so what are you doing in the world of books? He said, oh, I'm writing this thing about dinosaurs and DNA, and my eyes got wide and suddenly I wanted to hear more and I coaxed it out of him until he told me basically the whole story so that's uh, how the whole thing began. It's pretty clear that timing was 100% perfect for both Crichton and Steven with the story. However, both the original source material and the film have major differences. So with that said, what are the plots of the book that are compared to the movie? The novel's plot starts off in 1989, oddly enough with strange animal attacks occurring throughout Costa Rica and the nearby island of Isla Nublar that was actually used as the opening to the Lost World. Paleontologist Alan Grant and his paleobotanist graduate student Ellie Sattler are contacted to confirm the animal's identity, but they are abruptly whisked away by billionaire John Hammond, founder of the bioengineering firm InGen, for a weekend visit to a biological preserve he has established on the island. The preserve is a cover for the construction of Jurassic Park, a theme park showcasing living, breathing dinosaurs. With the construction nearly complete, with the realization of the dinosaurs recreated through ancient DNA found in the blood inside insects that were fossilized and preserved in amber from 65 million years ago. Gaps in the genetic code were filled with reptilian, avian, or amphibian DNA. On top of that, all dinosaurs are engineered to be female to prevent unauthorized breeding. Well, the novel was ahead of its time. Assumptions. The recent animal attacks have made Hammond's investors skittish, so Hammond requests that a few experts in dinosaurs tour the island to endorse it ahead of the park's opening. They are joined by mathematician and chaos theorist Ian Malcolm and a lawyer representing the investors with Donald Gennaro, both of whom are pessimistic about the park and the consequences of the island's environment. Hammond also invites his grandchildren, Tim and Alexis, or Lex Murphy, to join the tour. The park's staff includes engineer John Arnold, biotechnologist Henry Wu, game warden Robert Muldoon, public relations manager Ed Regis, and veterinarian Harding. Tara! While touring the park, Grant finds a velociraptor eggshell, seemingly provides Malcolm assertion that the dinosaurs are breeding against the genetics design. However, the disgruntled chief programmer of Jurassic Park software, Dennis Nedry, commits corporate espionage for Lewis Doxon, an agent of InGen's rival company, Biosyn. Nedry disables the security systems and steals frozen embryos for the park's 15 dinosaur species, but becomes lost due to a tropical storm and is killed by a Dilophosaurus. To make matters worse, the hyped-up acid of the park, Tyrannosaurus Rex, attacks the tour groups, as our characters must now survive the land of prehistoric giants and get off the island. But only to find out the animals have an expansive speed in reproduction and can become a hazard to not just the island, but the world's entire ecosystem if they ever get out of the containment from the island. Now, if it isn't obvious enough, the book's tone in comparison to the film is not just more deep in the yin-yang of genetic science, but is much more dark and horrific than the film adaptation. And there are much more different takes than what I originally expected when reading it. Not just in whole scenes and philosophies, but also in terms of characters. Grant and Ellie are much more different in their relationship. They don't have much intimacy in comparison to the film, cause in the novel, Ellie is actually a protege to Grant's paleontological research. Well. Grant's disinterest in a relationship is due to the loss of his wife before the events of Jurassic Park. Oddly enough, reminding me of a younger version of Nolan from 1977's Orca. My wife was pregnant. She was driving to the hospital, alone. A drunken driver came down the wrong side of the road and hit her. He killed her. And he killed my baby. 
He's also described as a bearded man, for which Crichton has said to have been inspired by, at the time, newly popular paleontologist Jack Horner, famous for discovering the massive nesting ground of Mayasaura, which was in the book more than likely replaced with the Parasaurolophus seen in the distance of the Brachiosaurus plains in Montana in the mid-80s. Jack Horner, of course, would become the franchise's top dinosaur expert for scientific accuracy, for better or for worse. My hypothesis is that a T-Rex was actually a scavenger rather than a killer, rather than a predator, and we see that in this movie more than we see it in the other ones. No, 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 no. Shut the fuck! Ironically, Jack Horner would not only popularize the theory through the film that dinosaurs are more related to birds than reptiles in the public consciousness. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. But ultimately would start a crusade in creating his own Jurassic Park in the studies of genetics to recreate dinosaur-esque creatures with chicken embryos, which is still in development to this day. Ironic, since the inspiration for Grant became more of a John Hammond in real life. So maybe there will be a dino chicken. I'm sure there'll be a dino chicken. You're sure there'll be a dino chicken? I think we'll be able to make a dino chicken within the next five years. Now, eventually, you do plan to have dinosaurs on your on your dinosaur tour, right? Hello? Uh, hello? Yes? Speaking of, arguably the biggest difference of character from book to film is the head of Jurassic Park, John Hammond. In the film, being played by the acting legend Sir Richard Attenborough, which, oddly enough, Stephen wanted to cast as Toodles in his prior film, Hook. Yahoo! <laughs> Unlike the film, where Hammond is a Walt Disney archetype wanting to create something joyful for the world to see, the book plays him much more like a Dr. Victor Frankenstein archetype with an aging old man willing to risk everything for the achievements of genetic science and research. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Hammond, I suppose, has that quality that um, the people who are trying to attract venture capital have, in, in the novel anyway, which is a, a certain unscrupulousness. I really wanted to do the dark side of Walt Disney. The character of Ian Malcolm in the book is about the same as the film, no doubt thanks to Jeff Goldblum's amazing performance, and like I said in my original review, his downright perfection. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Tim and Lex are also the same, but their age and characteristics are switched for the film. Lex is the little sister, and Tim is the older brother. This change was due to both whom Steven had cast in the film, most notably with Joseph Mazzolo as Tim, due to his loving audition for Jack Banning and Hook, whom the role went to actor Charlie Cosmo. The other reason was to give more attention to the female characters in comparison to their lack of dynamics in the book. The same applied to the character of Ellie Sattler to make her more important to the film's plot, and to give her somewhat more of a mother figure in comparison to Alan Grant being a father figure for the kids. It's hard to get a grasp on comparisons to Attorney Gennaro. The only push in the film is that his character is more simplified as greedy when opportunity in the dinosaur shows in his favor. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. Dr. Wu is greatly reduced from the book, but expanded and adapted more in the Jurassic World sequels. Other characters like Robert Muldoon, Arnold, and Dennis Nedry are about the same in the film, but are given more described grisly demises in the book, which I'll talk about later. However, characters like veteran Jerry Harding and in the Teletale game by John Curry only makes a cameo appearance in that one scene, and even Ed Regis' character is written out of the film. Although certain aspects of his character, such as his nervousness and cowardice, are given to the film's version of Donald Gennaro. Gennaro's death sequence during the T-Rex attack in the film is reminiscent of Regis' death in the book. But the biggest changes come from the pace, plot, and tone, which, like I said, is much darker in comparison to the film. This was due to Stephen wanting to use the novel to create the definitive dinosaur movie for all ages, as essentially his own King Kong, which followed up to The Lost World and goes back to when Universal offered him a Kong remake, ironically, when the book was published in 1990 and the opening of Universal Studios Florida. These were the goals the director wanted in adapting the book, which originally took more of a kin to the tone of a sci-fi horror story. And all of a sudden, the second I read his book, I realized that we weren't 
dealing with monsters, and this was not going to be a genre of horror or back to the famous Monsters of Filmland magazine culture. But instead, this was a really credible look at how dinosaurs might someday be brought back. And, and that really fascinated me and that immediately set my own template for not making this a monster movie. This applied to a very similar structure in 1975 when he adapted Peter Benchley's Jaws as well. The story structure is about the same, but there are lots of scenes trimmed down or cut from the novel, most notably the dinosaur segments. The opening was cut as a starter and saved for the sequel film, and even the dinosaur specimens differ. The Apatosaurus, and in some publications a Camarasaurus, is the Brachiosaurus in the film. Also, the book describes how many of each species are on the island, with the sauropods, for instance, having a total of 17 specimens. The sick triceratops in the film was originally a stegosaurus in the novel. This change was due to Steven's love for the animal as a kid when he was taken to a museum as a child. My first toy from a museum that I ever got was a little lead cast triceratops. And I became fascinated as a kid, as all kids do, because I think they're bigger than us and they were something that doesn't exist today. And I think because it doesn't exist today, and there's no immediate direct access, it becomes the thing that mythology is made of that makes mythology so fascinating. Something that he also put in the film script where Alan Grant first encounters the Triceratops. God, I see was my favorite when I was a kid, and now I see she's the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Which some of the filmmakers involved, real-life experiences made it into the script, including the pioneering achievements of CGI. When ILM brought the first tests of a full-scale dinosaur scene, stop-motion animator Phil Tippett, who was assigned to originally do all the wide shots in stop-motion as dinosaur supervisor in the film, YOU HAD ONE SHOT! Phil! Phil, you make me angry, Phil! Famously turned to Steven during the test screening, stating that he felt his craft was extinct. This was written into the film when the group first entered the visitor center. So what are you thinking? We're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? The Gallimimus stampede in the film was originally a herd of hadrosaurs in the book. The Gallimimuses, oddly enough, were never in the original book to begin with, only mentioned in the follow-up The Lost World. This change was suggested by Phil Tippett early on in pre-production because he felt the Gallimimus provided more speed and excitement to the scene on screen. And given his prior resume including a Struthiomimus in the Christopher Reeve TV dinosaur documentary, it seems kind of fitting he wanted to animate more types of these creatures for this film. And while the raptors and Tyrannosaurus are about perfect adaptations, there are several dinosaur species that were cut in adaptation. Dryosaurus, Uapacephalus, Stachysaurus, Microceratops, among a few other genetically engineered species. There was also a set of pterosaurs in the novel called Ceridactyls, which break out of the park's aviary attacking Grant and the kids crossing the river. This scene would later be loosely adapted and expanded on in Jurassic Park 3. Oh my god. What is it? It's a bird king. These changes also affects the plot seen in the novels. Way, For instance, Malcolm, Wu, and Hammond die in the first book. Malcolm's death was due to the bacteria being bitten by a T-Rex, despite being high on morphine after the attack and being recovered from the group, with the injuries enough to actually kill him. Remind me to thank John for a lovely weekend. However, Hammond's death is much more horrific, having worries for the future of InGen, is distracted in trips in the jungle only to be eaten alive by a pack of toxic compies, which is something the films don't acknowledge, but if you read the book, you can see why the death is pretty disturbing. Though Camp Cretaceous did finally make it canon in the second season, and yes, that's coming up next. Plus, Ed, who was never shown in the film, is killed by a juvenile T-Rex, which was later adapted into a scene for the Lost World film. And oddly enough, Hammond's death was also adapted for the sequel film for Peter Stormare's character to be killed off. This was essentially Steven's vengeance for Peter Stormare's character killing all those people in Fargo. Wu also meets the same fate as Arnold and Muldoon, with the raptors pillaged on the park's main control centers, with a major passage that showcases even higher intelligence than the movie did, by showcasing the raptors speeding up their reproduction to migrate into the mainland. This philosophy was kind of given to Alan Grant's presentation at a university in Jurassic Park 3. Were it not for the cataclysmic events which overtook them, it is entirely possible that raptors rather than humans would have become the dominant species on this planet. This leads to arguably the biggest change that was passed from the film adaptation, which was the demise of the island and the 
fate of the dinosaurs. With the raptors smart enough to plant their offspring on the fairies off the island, almost giving me alien vibes, the group debate the animal's existence more so than the films, with all the characters conflicted on what the fate of the island would be, only with the added pressure of the approaching Costa Rican government, planning to destroy the island and its assets. This concept wasn't fully adapted in later sequels and even contradicts some expanded canon like the Telltale game. Its only slight nod in the film is the lysine contingency mentioned by Arnold. The lysine contingency is intended to prevent the spread of the animals in case they ever get off the island. Dr. Wu inserted a gene that creates a single faulty enzyme in protein metabolism. The animals can't manufacture the amino acid lysine. Unless they're completely supplied with lysine by us, they slip into a coma and die. By the end of the book, it leaves off on a pretty depressing note with our heroes recovering in the mainland hospital and Dr. Grant being visited with the news that dinosaurs are being spotted in the mainland and has been ordered in for questioning with the notion that none of them will be let off free now being under the custody of the government. This ending somewhat mirrors the ending of the Jurassic Park ripoff Carnosaur, also based on a popular dinosaur horror novel, but I'll mention more later. I'll discuss more scenes and the darker thematic elements of the source material in a sec, but before we get to some of the meat and greed of this video, the book was obviously a smash hit bestseller upon publishing, and right away Steven got the rights with Universal, which, funny enough, he almost lost to the likes of James Cameron in adapting the book. But Steven's magic touch and friendship with Crichton was enough to win the novelist over, and in 1993 the film was the biggest box office success in history, until ironically topped by Cameron himself with Titanic in 1997. But Jurassic Park's success continued from book and film, and not just in merchandise and home video releases, but even contracting a ride being built before the film ended up in pre-production. Not to mention countless comic books and video games trying to be somewhat successors to the book and film. And with money rolling in, the demand for a novelized sequel from the author was inevitable. Especially given the fact that Crichton's other books were getting film adaptations left and right. While Crichton also stayed on as a screenwriter for other Spielberg films including Twister. Which you can tell the writer is better at writing books than he is screenplays. It's headed right for us! It's already here! You know, something's not right here. Hammond, what do you think? That bastard Michael Crichton. He sold his bathol after Jurassic Park to make a movie about tremendous that roar like a fucking dinosaur. Crystal was just Jurassic Park with God's facts blowing in the fucking winds. Hammond, are you okay? God damn it! Sorry, Dick Jack Sims. My voice box within my automated systems has been acting up and is one of the many cost effecting measures in the park. I don't like you using Diet Stephen Hawking's voice there, but... When John Hammond died, the AI voice systems were only functional from 1997 to 2000 and... 8. Stephen Hawking was the only one to provide the voice at the time. We are still trying to kick the bugs out of it. Now shut the fuck up before I have you sent a Stalag Luft 3. That was a great escape reference. That creeps me out! The Jurassic Park Legacy Reviews will be right back. Something big is coming to McDonald's. Or now. Something of such enormous proportions. Stand back. It could only be called the Jurassic Park Extra Value Meal. Okay. Let's see. An enormously juicy triple cheeseburger with fries and a medium drink in one of six free Jurassic Park collector cups. The Jurassic Park Extra Value Meal. A dino-sized value for a dino-sized appetite. Hey, where's mine? What you want is what you get at McDonald's today. All right. We now return to the Jurassic Park Legacy Reviews on Big Jack Films. In 1995, The Lost World was published and continued the story of the novel while also taking elements from the film. Don't worry, yet. I'm not making the same mistakes again. No, you're making, you're making all new ones. The plot 
catches up four years after the disaster at Jurassic Park, Chaos Theory and mathematician Ian Malcolm, who is revealed to have survived the events of the previous novel, encounters and reluctantly agrees to team up with the wealthy paleontologist Richard Levine. The two men attempt to search for a lost world of dinosaurs, following rumors of a strange animal corpses washing up on the shores of Costa Rica, which was teased at the end of the first book. They learn of Site B on Isla Sorna, was the production facility where the now-defunct company InGen hatched and grew the dinosaurs for their Jurassic Park theme park on the nearby Isla Nublar. Afraid that the Costa Rican government will find Isla Sorna and destroy the dinosaurs, Levine hastily embarks on an expedition to the island, which Malcolm follows suit, joined by Jack Doc Thorne, Eddie Carr, two stowaway children, R.B. Benton and Kelly Curtis, and Dr. Sarah Harding, an anthologist and close friend of Malcolm. But they're followed by another group led by geneticist Lewis Doxon, who was the character in the first novel who planned to steal the dinosaur eggs for Biosyn, the rival company of InGen responsible for the sabotage that led to the Jurassic Park disaster. Dachshund's group is attacked by a pair of tyrannosaurs as they try to steal eggs from the animal's nest. Later, while inspecting the T-Rex's nest, Malcolm finds that one of the infants has been injured and has a broken leg. He instructs Eddie to kill it because it has no chance of survival in the wild. Unbeknownst to the group, however, Eddie refuses to kill the injured animal and brings it back to the trailers. When the group discovers the animal, Malcolm and Hardy begrudgingly agree to set a cast around its leg while the rest of the group returns to the high hide. Basically, a automatic wench treehouse, as they are attacked by a pack of nocturnal velociraptors emerging from the jungle. The group later takes refuge in the general store of an old InGen worker village and formulate a plan to reach the landing site where the helicopter is set, but they are attacked by a pair of chameleon-like cartotauruses. Among evading all the dinosaurs, the group find out InGen infected the animals with the disease that shortens the dinosaurs' lifespan and infects their brains, leading to their faster-than-expected extinction. Once again, the characters and story take major changes from book to film, much more than the first film. It retcons Malcolm's death, which neither happened in any of the movies at all, and some characters differ from the film. While Sarah Harding is about the same, though name-dropping being the daughter of Harding from the first book, Eddie Carr is more of a navigator in the film, and Kelly was, was never Malcolm's daughter in the book. On top of that, the second team were totally original characters not really seen in the book, including Roland Temple, played by the amazingly talented late Pete Pothafoint. Somewhere on this island is the greatest predator that ever lived. Second greatest predator must take him down. The biggest change, however, was with Lewis Doxon being removed from the film, being replaced by Hammond's nephew, Peter Ludlow, played by Eris Howard. Okay. In terms of the dinosaurs, I've mentioned comparisons in the past, but here I can fully focus on it. The T-Rex is a given, of course, among other animals brought over from the previous book. But this time there's new species either adapted to the film or just showcased in the Lost World novel. Pachycephalosaurus, for example, being the most prominent, and while popular, made more publicly consciousness with the film, with the incredible designs by Stan Winston's team, and the I'm awesome toys by Kenner. Pachycephalosaurus? Carnivore? Huh? No, not herbivore, late Cretaceous. The books about new dinosaurs mostly introduced the likes of Hypsilophodon, Mosasaurus, and even Ornitholestes, which hasn't had much attention in media since the BBC Walking with Dinosaurs series. But one of the best creatures in the book is the freakishly genetic Carnotaurus, standing out as one of the most dangerous predators on Isla Sorna. Its biggest traits were the use of chameleon DNA spliced into the animal, allowing it to camouflage, and look in all directions, making it harder to hold still when evading it. This greenish hell spawn of InGen was adapted in the Sega arcade game, and you think would be a great antagonist in the movies, right? Well, not really. When they finally got to showcasing the animal in the Jurassic World saga, they rejected the chameleon look and went for something more simple and scientifically accurate. Though it kept the original color designs as the original Kenner toy, it would have been nice to see as a proper monstrous creature. But. I'm okay with what we got. However, the overall story in the book is a lot simpler and more different from the film. I'm 
not gonna lie when I say that the second book is a little drier than the first book. While we get to see new animals and advance the story, the book feels a little held back, but much like the first does enlighten some dark thematic elements, such as genetic science along with the greed and self-destruction of human behavior. The book doesn't end like the film, and more or less kills the dinosaurs then and there, sort of giving it that Beneath the Planet of the Apes vibes to it. No more sequels, that's it. Man is evil, capable of nothing but destruction. In fact, the climax is a mix of both the midway action set pieces in the film, with the vehicles on the cliff, crossed with an element the film never fully adapted, with the T-Rex nest being the demise of our human baddies. Unfortunately, the second book, while scaled down, gets lost in its own jungle, and reading it myself, I was expecting something as good as book one, and nowadays I kinda understand Steven tossing about 85% of the book out, and mostly using the Conan Doyle novel The Lost World, which side note just for precaution, I took a rereading and honestly is a better structured story. When Michael told me that he was gonna write a book uh, and he was thinking about calling it The Lost World. I immediately was thrilled because I'm a big fan of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's book, The Lost World. And even though these two subjects bear no resemblance to each other, the idea of being inside a prehistoric world that exists somewhere in this world today, and not behind electrified fences, not a theme park or a ride, but actually a jungle of dinosaurs in the wild, living without the intervention of man, that really compelled me. And I thought, wow, what a great, what a great story. This also included a new third act with the T-Rex in San Diego, taking a cue from the 1925 film, mixed with Steven's excuse to make a Godzilla movie. It suddenly is a Godzilla movie, and I just have only dreamed about making one of these as a child. Yeah. As a grown-up, I'm ashamed of myself. Speaking of, it's not just creatures cut from the book. Whole scenes were either scrapped, unused, or later adapted into other films. While scenes created for the film were either scrapped or recycled for future films, less can be said about scenes from the novel that would be really cool to see. In the first Jurassic Park, there is a scene in the book that many have wanted to adapt with Grant to the kids being continuous prey for the T-Rex to hunt from the jungles of its paddock to the river rapid scene all of which were given concept art, but never used in any of the movies. However, it was the main source to adapt in the Jurassic Park ride. Many of the deaths were later adapted, like Woo's was later used in the fourth film for Vincent D'Onofrio's character. But the second book's usage of the Camo Carnos, and more usage of the Rex Nest, would have been a decent scare if they were able to do it. However, with said scares is where the books mostly differ from the films. Okay, let's be real here, folks. While the franchise is entertaining and the first film is a sheer masterpiece, it's pretty clear why this adaptation, while a fun time for everyone to make, if adapted properly, would not be aimed at children. This is a novel that, given its subject matter, themes, and tone, would more than likely get the film put into the horror genre, along with getting a hard R rating, and in terms of the budget, it would have probably ended up in the same qualities of Carnosaur. Which, at this point, I finally have to address and talk about given the comparisons to their book counterparts are unavoidable now. Based on the 1984 novel by Harry Adam Knight and John Brosinon, God, why was 1984 such a dark period for everything? The novel bears several similarities to Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, though Carnosaur preceded the latter work by six years. Brosinon's fear was that the public would have thought that the reissue of Carnosaur would have been seen as a plagiarism to Jurassic Park. He admitted that he liked the scene in the Crichton novel film adaptation involving dinosaurs rampaging through a museum, as it bore direct similarities to an incident featured in the Carnosaur book. These concerns were only after the book got a cheaper film by B-movie legend in the late Roger Corman, rest in peace, that loosely adapted the novel's plot, but of course took more from the ideas of Crichton's novel to cash in on the film Jurassic Park, which is closer than you think with the genetic scientist played by Diane Ladd, who, no joke, is the mother of Jurassic Park's Laura Duren. That's really fabulous. Make a great theme park. Ah! 
bringing dinosaurs back to life through genetic engineering and local chicken farms and eventually human hosts that take a cue from Alien, the film was released before Jurassic Park in early 1993 during the start of the Year of the Dinosaur, making it a healthy success for Corman's production company, while also being critically well-received, including Siskel and Ebert at the time. Jurassic Park is coming out next month and it's going to feature high-tech dinosaurs. It's going to be interesting to see, however, whether he has any humans as enjoyable as Diane Ladd's character in Carnosaur. So, a marginal thumbs up for me. Well, a thumbs down for me, Gene, although I did enjoy Diane Ladd's kind of mad intensity. She has that sort of way of zeroing in on her lines as if everything in the entire future of mankind I, depends I think, upon I, what she's doing here. This allowed Corman to spawn many direct-to-video sequels that ended up being alien ripoffs or just plain shitty. <laughs> Should all be destroyed. I do enjoy the entertainment value of the first two films, and less can be said about the third film onwards, which you can definitely skip. If you want a more in-depth, detailed video essay on the Carnosaur franchise and the novel itself, I would highly recommend the amazing retrospective by Dino Diego on YouTube. It's really worth checking out. The reason I bring this up is that the Corman film showcased the sheer horrors that could have been for Jurassic Park. The book's deaths are undoubtedly dark, sinister, and downright greedy. Regis' death is described as essentially a decapitation by a juvenile T-Rex, though some variants refer to it as an Allosaurus. On top of that, Dr. Wu, Muldoon, Gennaro, and Harding are all killed pretty viciously by the raptors in the vein of a slasher flick, which of course was split up for multiple different outcomes. And again, Hammond's death was pretty horrific in the book, and even mentioned in passing in Camp Cretaceous Season 3, which they also finally confirmed his death at the end of the Lost World movie. Legend has it that the original park owner broke his ankle here and then was eaten alive by compies. John Hammond died of natural causes. Where'd you hear that? Read it somewhere? Even in the book itself, the deaths in the sequels are also horrific, with most of Dachshund's men viciously murdered by the island's predators, and even Dachshund getting killed being fed to the T-Rex via a kick from Sarah Harding. While his death is totally different in the recent film, the kick of death was actually kind of adapted for the Jurassic World live show, which I'll briefly talk about next time. But the most disturbing death in the book, which has been the most fascinating for fans, is the original death of the park's head computer programming and traitor, Dennis Nedry. As we all know, Nedry in the film is killed by the Dilophosaurus both via its toxic spitting venom and being eaten within the jeep, which cutting away makes it come off as unintentionally funny. In the book, not only is it more violent, but it's just downright disturbing. While the spirit is accurate to the book, the creature's size is the first major change. The Dilophosaurus was not meant to be a scientifically accurate size to the Velociraptors. In fact, both species sizes were essentially reversed. Dilophosaurus was the size of a horse, whereas the raptors were the size of a turkey. That doesn't look very scary. More like a six foot turkey. And while the Dilophosaurus did not actually have toxic spit, that was added in the book. For those who complain the films are not scientifically accurate, remember, it's established in the book and films that the dinosaurs are spliced with other animal DNA to compensate the missing genetic codes, mostly using frog and other amphibian DNA, making the animals, while related to birds, are more reptilian in the mix of accuracy and what paleontologists now call retrosaurs. But being blinded and killed in the car wasn't enough in the book, as the Dilophosaurus afterwards would slice open Nedry's stomach, spilling his intestines, with Nedry only feeling them like a long string of sausages and being eaten alive. In fact, the description in the book was used in the beginning of the film to describe the raptors as told by Grant. He slashes at you across the belly, spilling your intestines. The point is, you are alive when they start to eat you. 
Reading the book, this was a major ball drop in terms of tone and comparisons to the film, and shocked me to my core. And you can see due to aiming it at a more family-friendly audience is probably why they cut it. It's honestly fascinating how six films only take minor elements and themes from the original source material in what is redeemed as pure spectacle for visuals and never its thematic messages. Making me honestly think, guys that a remake might better suit the franchise. Now, listen, that's pretty on edge for the Jurassic fanbase given how remakes never fully match the original. But with Jurassic Park, hear me out. It's clear from Steven and the filmmakers that if the books were fully adapted for the screen, they would lean more into the elements of horror and darker messages about nature and science that would more than likely give the film an R rating, much like its cheaper ripoff Carnosaur. But because Jurassic Park was the first major publication of a dinosaur story that gained a popular status since the likes of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World almost a hundred years prior, adapting it for all dinosaur lovers, both young and old, that the film had to be more in line for all audiences to enjoy. This meant the book's R-rated tone had to be trimmed to a PG-13 audience and more geared to sell merchandise to kids, which Universal really was keen on after deals with Kenner and McDonald's, among others, who at that point had a much tighter grip on film marketing after the disastrous promotion of Batman Returns to family-friendly audiences without seeing the final cut a year prior. Because of this, the films and inevitable sequels were more aimed for family adventure film tones, much like Steven's prior work on the Indiana Jones movies. Which, to the author's source material in hindsight, seems kind of unfair. And considering how the new trilogy, much like Star Wars, didn't really stick the landing, and despite the inevitable next installment, it's why I feel the franchise needs a major facelift with a remake and lean more towards the novel's themes and darker story rather than the whimsical Spielberg tone. The best example of this would be the recent theatrical adaptations of Stephen King's It. Yes, while I lean more towards the original TV movie adaptations starring the only cast once Tim Curry in one of his most iconic roles of the demon clown Pennywise, <laughs> the remake split into two films was much more faithful to the books and was able to adapt the novel more fluently in about five hours, despite some stuff obviously not getting adapted. Oh yeah, no, I'm not doing that. And I feel Jurassic Park could get the same proper treatment. Plus, the setup is there. If you adapted both books and split them into two films each, you could have a four-film reboot franchise ready to go and give more respected adaptive material to Michael Crichton's vision. I mean, look at Westworld with the television series adapted more faithfully to the books than its original theatrical counterpart. You could also give the audience what they want with more scientifically accurate dinosaurs, or stick closer to what was presented in the novel and explain better why the dinosaurs differ further from paleontology, given the frog DNA attached to the genes of the animals. And hey, it might even give Mr. DNA a run for his money in exposition dumping. Now come on, y'all. Why you got this little old me like that? Oh, god damn it, Mr. DNA. Wait, I thought you were a cartoon. Our budget was too cheap for some hand-drawn cartoons, son. But Mr. Hammond said spare no expense. Why you run over again and I'll cut you? I mean, uh, Dano DNA. It's like I'm talking to a nerd's rope genetically spliced with a set of anal beads. Talk about mix and match! Shut up! But overall, the Jurassic Park novels are much more a form of conflict with the films adapted from them. They're much more darker stories that don't hold back on the graphic details and thematic elements and leaving behind a legacy that both Michael Crichton and Steven Spielberg never could have seen despite both creators' enthusiastic expectations in the results. Again, I still feel the books could use a better adaptation after the franchise's latest movies, but again, given the latest installment, we're still very far away from that idea. And with that said, the books themselves are worth a read if you got the time. Having read them after the release of Fallen Kingdom fully to see where that movie shot itself in the foot, I was really intrigued by the end of my time on them, and they really do stand on their own for the franchise's humble beginnings, coming in at a positive 9 out of 10. 
In all honesty, I can't really pick between the books which one is better in comparisons to ranking the films, but they hold enough interest for Jurassic fans of the movie to take a look at for more insight on the author's vision, because without him, the franchise would not be as popular as it is today, much like the discovery of dinosaurs themselves and their evolution in the pop culture. I appreciate you giving us access to Blue and Rexy during the battle, Roger. It came in handy immensely. I'm sure the animals were able to take care of themselves, and no need to worry about the expense of bringing them back to Jurassic Park. We took care of that afterwards. Are they here? Safe and secure. In fact, that battle was a testing ground to advance their interactions with human behavior. This will further enhance our research for better understanding of these animals. As if six movies and a Netflix show didn't already do that? Well, one of our most interesting funders authorized the mission. Wait, you don't run InGen? Of course, not my boy. In fact... <laughs> Waiting for orders. You should hurry she'll put all of us on her death belt! Blue? Hey, Blue? Hey, girl? Remember me? Yeah. Time to go on. Wait, you know Owen? I said it's fuck once! It's alright. You help me out. Yeah, that's it. Good. Good. Easy, 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 easy. That's it. Well, listen to me, Blue. Listen very carefully. You gotta go back, okay? Back up, back in your pet. I'll put in a good word with the boss, and he'll get you a nice, fresh, tasty dinner, okay? Got it? Peach? That's it. Good girl. Don't give me a shit. Run! Go! That's it. Good girl. Well done, Jack. That was really, really swell. I would like a word with your new manager, Roger. If you want to open up the summer back up for the kids. If not, it's a Cretaceous period for all of us. Secrets ready. Yeah. 
but it will be more perfected when we get more references through the security cameras. Be sure that they watch our guests all the way. Of course. Our leaders don't want to make sure that we have more funding to keep an eye on him. Can't be done before the weekend is finished. What do you think I'm doing here? Fuck. I don't promise, okay? Plus, my clients are getting impatient. I need to get a test done on the Paradox 9 acid as soon as possible. Doctor, what? she needs time to be sedated. Do you think I care? And we will see the results with a response. Here we go.